Hello, good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Karen Chackle, and I'm the County Manager for First American Title and this year's Chair for the UCSB Economics Forecast Project. We've revamped our mid-year sponsor event to include you, the public, so that we can address, educate, and share ideas on how we move forward after the devastation of the Thomas Fire and the Montecito debris flow. Without further ado, here's Peter Rupert. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so this is a little bit about, a little different for us to do this from the forecast project, but we're going to talk about the disasters and a little bit of the impacts, and I'll explain why this is going to be difficult uh, to think about. As you can see, the Thomas Fire burned uh, 281,000 acres, uh, largest in California on record. There was another fire that was a little bit bigger, but it seeped over into Nevada. Um, so this is the largest California. The cost, uh, insurance claims, we have the California Insurance Commissioner here, so he can yell at me if this is the wrong number. Uh, a lot of numbers have been thrown around. This one is about $1.8 $1 billion uh, uh, for insurance claims, and the firefighting costs alone were about $177 million. It produced really, really bad air quality in Santa Barbara, I think, as everyone knows. So that top picture um, is on a regular day, and this is what a picture looks like during the, during the fire. Uh, very, very bad air quality. How bad is the air quality? Well, this is uh, particulate data, uh, uh, and this basically is the stuff that's really bad for you to breathe. Any number over 50 here is considered unhealthy. That's the first red line. The second red line is extremely unhealthy. You're not even supposed to be outside. And you can see the effect of the Thomas Fire over here. It's up or over like 400. It's a, just amazingly bad air quality that we had here. And no wonder people weren't showing up in Santa Barbara and uh, uh, you know, staying, staying in hotels and things. Okay, so I want to think a little bit about what happens after a fire. So we have a little bit of data from some of the other fires, the T fire, for example. And what we did was we went out and we looked at these assessor parcel numbers, these APNs, and we looked at the places that had been um, uh, devastated. And basically, uh, for the T fire, we had 262 of them. 202 had improvements, 53 had no improvements. Now, that doesn't exactly mean they didn't rebuild, but it's been a while now and they probably are not rebuilding. That's almost, that's around 20% of all houses uh, that were destroyed that weren't rebuilt. If you look at the Jesusita fire, we have 174 APNs, uh, 144 improved, 28 with minimal or none. That's a little over 15%. So again, what happens sometimes in these things is people aren't rebuilding. They're not coming back and rebuilding on some of these properties. In, a, in Sonoma County, just this last year, 5% of the stock of houses in Sonoma County were destroyed by fire. Uh, housing prices, we talked to some people up there, their housing prices started to rise because there are 5% fewer houses. They haven't started to rebuild, obviously, yet. And many have decided not to rebuild. They're moving into other locations, other counties, as they seem more safe to them. Um, obviously, as an economist, we talk about a little bit demand and supply. When the supply of housing falls, obviously the price of houses is going to go up. In Montecito, this is unclear. Certainly the housing supply is now down. The question is whether demand will stay the same. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But the idea is if we're not living in a safe environment, people are not going to demand housing in Montecito, um, basically, which will drive the demand down. And then who knows whether prices uh, will actually fall or not. So now I want to move to the, the debris flow. Uh, talking with the Public Works Department, they're responsible for roughly 15% of the land area in Montecito. They removed 500,000 cubic yards of debris and mud from uh, Montecito. Just to give you some reference, one of those big dump trucks holds 10 cubic yards. So there were 50,000 trucks uh, deliveries uh, on our roads. And by the way, when you think about these lasting impacts, talking to Public Works, you know, they said that the road deterioration alone is going to be very expensive because they're going to depreciate much faster than had these trucks not been on them. So there's these kind of things that people don't, don't really think about um, here. The Public Works Department spent $24 million cleaning and removal. The Army Corps of Engineers spent another $80 million on cleanup and $30 million on, on removal. So this was a very, very expensive just getting back to where we, where we are. So now what we did, we decided uh, it was the forecast project, the chamber, women's economic ventures, um, uh, and the tourism, and who else was, a couple other people were there. And anyway, so we decided to send out a survey to the community, the business community, to find out their impacts, 
not trying to guess anything. We wanted them to tell us what, what really happened. And the idea was to try to find out how many businesses closed, how many people they may have laid off, how many hours um, were, were lost, and what about revenue. And um, so we kind of also wanted to know, are you going to have to close your business? And if not, sort of, you know, what is it that you have to do? So we got 293 responses. Uh, obviously, not, most of them were from the South Coast. Most of them for uh, about 93% were from the South Coast alone. So here's some of the data. And by the way, these are just, I use Google Forms. So Google Forms are pretty good. So if you guys want to send out surveys, you just use Google Forms. And Google Forms, when they, when they come back, it's all electronic. And they present these kinds of uh, pictures. You don't have to do anything to them. They do, it does it automatically. But so the top two industries that were affected, retail trade and accommodation and food services. Those are the two largest um, uh, sectors. The question we asked was, how important is tourism to your business? Where one is not important and five is very important. And one third of all of the responses that we got said that uh, tourism was very, very important to their, to their business. And as I mentioned earlier with the fires, uh, you know, tourism was down a little bit, but Kathy is going to talk a little more about that. Bonders in our survey had to close their business at some point. On average, the businesses in Montecito and, and parts that were affected were closed for about 13 days. Um, the longest closure was 72 days that a business was closed. And I think all of you who know about business, you know, without some kind of business interruption insurance, that's a, that's a major hit um, to, to finances. How many hours a day were reduced? Um, so th this blue one is zero. So 30% um, of the responders said they didn't reduce any hours. 70% um, did. And this purple, 17%, said they had to reduce hours by about six to eight hours a day to do, when they were doing business. 50% of the responders had to lay off at least one employee during this time period. The total layoffs up till now were 213 employees that were laid off, and 13 of the business responders said they're not going to rehire uh, into their business. Revenues, um, obviously a lot of people don't like to give their revenues, but the ones that did, we got 40% response. Um, uh, they said there were 4.9 million less between the de December 2016 and December 2017. So this is just from our responders, by the way. This is not from everybody. And 2.5 million less between January 2016 and January 2017. So these were very, very large uh, uh, effects. Uh, insurance, Dave will talk a little more about this. Total reported property damage from our sample was 301,000. Um, Fifty percent of the businesses had insurance for these types of disasters. Fewer than 10% lost inventory, so it wasn't a big inventory loss. And then what we asked was, you know, have you received or do you anticipate receiving any money from insurance claims? And 86% said um, no, and 13 said yes, they're going to be receiving, uh, you know, basically insurance claims. Now, think about these lasting impacts. 15% of the sample said they need financial assistance to continue. So without some financial assistance, and by the way, FEMA has been great. Um, our banking sector has been great in helping businesses. Uh, SBA, et cetera. So they've all really pitched in. Um, and then we asked them, so what are you going to do now that you don't know things are going to come back? Number one, they said they were going to focus more on online sales if possible. And number two, many of them thought about relocating uh, to, a, to a different area. Um, so the Google Sheets don't do such a great job if you have short answers because they fill in all here. But 90% basically said that they're, they're going to uh, not have to close their business. So measuring the impact, I mentioned it's very difficult to measure the economic impact of this. And the reason it's very difficult is many businesses that were affected lost revenue during the shutdown um, uh, of the freeway. Um, you know, things that you don't even see happen. For example, Pete Giordano of Giordano's was telling us that um, because he had to go, when the 101 was closed, he had to go around through Bakersfield. The problem wasn't just that he had to use more gas to deliver goods. But because of union rules, he had to hire, have another person in the truck with him. So it was twice the, the labor cost for, you know, to deliver goods. And these are things we don't really see. And so those are the kind of things that, you know, it's going to be hard to, to tease out of the data. And businesses lost revenue. They lost employees. On the other hand, Goleta, um, their tr uh, transient occupancy tax, it was up 59% over last year. All the first responders and many of the evacuees from Montecito were staying in Goleta in hotels. So they were fully booked maybe not at the, uh, the, the, the standard rates. Um, and by the way, there was more capacity there too. So if you remove the new hotels, they were still up 25%. The other issue we're going to run into is, you know, thinking about how are we going to rebuild? 
do we have enough contractors, builders? Are they going to be from here, from other counties, etc.? So next steps. My thinking about this, talking with, uh, with several people, is that if we want to think about the demand for housing in Montecito and in, in our areas, we have to provide a safe environment. That's the number one thing we have to do. So public works has to get in. Uh, Joe will talk a little bit about reassessing. But as we know now that um, from public works, they're going to have to go in first and find the new property lines. So they're going to go in first and determine where the roadways are, the offsets, etc. Then people can come back and say, okay, here's our property lines. A once in a 200 year event, by the way, which was the rains, does not mean it happens once in every two years, a 200 years, does it? It could happen tomorrow. Once in 200 means it's rare, but rare events happen all the time. One of the last big rare events that people didn't really understand was a 40% decline in housing prices in 2008. That rarely happens, but it happened. So the point is that we don't know if it'll rain again tomorrow or it'll take another 700 years. That's just, it's just a rare event. And rare events happen randomly here. So the point I made earlier was that if we see, if it's not safe to live there, people are not going to demand housing there. That's all there is to it. And we're going to see places, uh, 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 people moving from other places. So we have a little to-do list. One is we need to analyze, repair, build new riparian corridors. So right now, if you read from the trail, uh, uh, the Montecito trails, if you look at them, people are saying they're no longer riparian corridors. They're actually canyons, what's happened. So all of these things have to be fixed, you know, so that if this happens again, um, uh, by the way, Carpinteria was, sa was mainly saved from the Santa Monica uh, riparian corridor that they built just a few years ago. Roads and congestion are another big deal. Um, once we're starting to do some of these repairs, um, people in Montecito, and Megan may talk about it a little bit, the roads are just you know, crazy jammed all the time now. And it's starting to creep up higher and higher up, up in, into Montecito. And the last thing I, I think we need to talk about is we need a cross-agency partnerships. We have to have SBCAG talking to Public Works, talking to the assessor's office, um, you know, trying to get everybody sort of on the same page to be able to just just move ahead um, properly. So that's kind of the results of, you know, as I mentioned, trying to figure out, you know, how big these impacts are. It's going to be hard. It's going to take many years, but um, we'll do it. Um, anyway, uh, thanks very much. And uh, I'd now I'd like to introduce Dave Jones, the California uh, Insurance Commissioner. Thank you very much, Peter, for that uh, tremendous presentation and for uh, providing so much rich detail about the economic impacts of the Thomas Fire uh, on Santa Barbara, Ventura counties. Uh, my name is Dave Jones, and I have the privilege of serving as your insurance commissioner. Some of you may not have realized you have an insurance commissioner, but you do. And the insurance commissioner is uh, directly elected by you. So I don't report to the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, attorney general, treasurer. They're all fine people. I work well with them, but uh, you're my bosses. I lead an independent consumer protection and law enforcement agency called the Department of Insurance. We have a table outside and some helpful materials that you might find useful as you think about insurance issues in your lives. I regulate the largest insurance market in the United States where insurers collect $290 billion a year in premium and have $5.5 trillion in assets under management. I have 1,400 dedicated civil servants that help me do that work. As I said, we're a consumer protection agency. We regulate the rates of property casualty insurance. In my tenure as your commissioner since 2011, I've saved businesses and consumers over three billion dollars by rejecting excessive rate increases and returned about 400 million dollars to consumers and businesses as a result of disputed claims or poor claims handling practices. So I thought I would drill down today and talk a little bit about um, the insured losses. And let me underscore that insured losses associated uh, with the fires in 2017 uh, and then talk a little bit about um, some of the things that are going on generally in California in the insurance market in terms of insurance availability and then talk about some things that I think the legislature needs to do to try to get in front of the issue of insurance availability. So, of course, um, in the wake of these terrible fires, uh, we deployed our personnel uh, into Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. I personally came to visit, talked to victims and survivors in the evacuation centers, uh, as well as deploying our personnel to the local assistance centers. We held insurance workshops. We deployed our law enforcement detectives into neighborhoods to try to suppress the unscrupulous scam artists that oftentimes flood into areas in the wake of these disasters, they issued a series of notices to insurers, uh, one asking them to expedite claims handling. I couldn't order that, but I asked them to do it, and they did it. 
Uh, they began cutting checks right away for up to 25% of personal contents coverage, as well as up to four months of uh, living expense coverage. Um, we discovered that some insurers uh, were giving people wrong information. Uh, we got 10 complaints along those lines. We immediately acted, issued a notice telling them they needed to give right information. Those complaints stopped. All told, we've uh, interacted with about 5,000 uh, individual contacts with fire survivors or mudslide survivors across the state in the wake of the 2017 fires. We've had about 470 uh, requests for assistance that have manifested as actual complaints against the insurers. And so far, uh, in, in working on those complaints, we've closed about half of them and returned about $24 million to people. So that's on the claims handling side of things to give you some sense of what we do and we continue to do. Um, we issued a notice very early on when we discovered people were having a hard time getting through filling out these detailed, exhaustive inventories of all their stuff. Uh, some of you here you know, may have lost your homes in these disasters. Then you've got to write down everything you lost when you bought it, how much it was paid for, how much it's depreciated. It's a lot to ask people to do when they've lost their entire home, all their belongings, all their precious mementos. So they asked the insurers to waive these inventory requirements and provide people up to 100% of contents coverage without that. Most of them have complied with that request. So um, outside of the table, uh, we've come up with about 11 different bill ideas to make the claims handling process better. Uh, and uh, some of the uh, representatives of the State Assembly and State Senate that represent your area are carrying those bills. If you're interested in doing a deeper dive on the claims handling side of things, uh, there's material out front that'll help you do that. Um, this collectively uh, is the most catastrophic fire-related event that California has ever seen. And I say collectively because these insured loss figures are for all of the 2017 wildfires. Um, these do not include the mudslide losses. We'll be uh, reporting those uh, Monday. Um, suffice it to say that uh, we don't have a total tally yet, but the mudslide losses will bump these figures up somewhere around $400 million. That was just Montecito alone. Um, but what these figures tell us is that, and they're broken out across different lines of insurance, and again, these are insured losses. These are based on actual claims figures. These are not estimates. These are not projections of economic loss. These are actual insured losses based on claims that have been filed. The grand total currently is $12.3 billion. Um, and taken collectively in the aggregate, we've never had uh, a, a more terrible and devastating disaster from the perspective of insured losses than these fires in October and December 2017. Uh, also, these fires were some of the most devastating in terms of the amount of acreage and certainly the amount of lives that were lost as well. And behind these numbers, of course, are terrible, terrible tragedies of lives lost, homes lost, precious mementos lost forever. Um, as you can see, uh, the lion's share of the losses are concentrated in personal uh, residential property, about $10.5 billion, uh, $1.5 billion in commercial property, $319 million for auto and other lines. I regretfully do not have a slide for Santa Barbara specifically, but let me just give you these numbers. So in Santa Barbara, there have been 2,354 residential property claims, of which 32 were for total losses. And again, these are not mudslides. These are just fire losses. And that amounts to $200 million in insured losses on the residential side for Santa Barbara alone. Uh, commercial properties, 266 claims, five total losses, $12.2 million. Now, the reason that number differs a little bit from Peter's number is that um, commercial property includes condos, apartment complexes, not just the businesses that Peter was reporting on a moment ago. But that gives you some sense of the enormity. Contrast Santa Barbara with Sonoma County, which suffered $7 billion in residential property losses, uh, 14,600 total claims, about 5,000 total losses. Um, so the lion's share of these losses were experienced in Northern California, principally in Sonoma County, but of course Santa Barbara suffered as well. So one of the um, things that insurers have been doing uh, more recently is using very sophisticated computer risk models to assess what the risk is of fire at your home. And these are models that use all sorts of data sets and they look at things like slope, topography, wind direction, experience with loss, et cetera, et cetera. And based on these risk models, insurers are increasingly deciding in some areas of the state, some insurers, not to write insurance. Now this is principally occurring in the 24 wildland urban interface counties and that's principally the uh, Sierra Nevadas, uh, the Foothill counties, a little bit on the coast. Um, 
But as you can see uh, from the counties that are listed here, there's a wide degree of variance with regard to the percentage of homes in a given county which are identified by the insurers to be high or very high risk. So the first column, of course, is the list of some counties. The second column lists all of the dwelling units in those, each of those counties. The third column lists the number of homes in each county which the insurers have rated as high or very high risk. And the last column is the percentage of the homes overall in the county that are rated high or very high risk. So to give you a flavor for that, if you go to the second from the bottom, Tuolumne, 82% uh, of the homes have been rated by insurers as high or very high risk. It's becoming increasingly a challenge for homeowners in Tuolumne County to find traditional private residential insurance. They're still finding it, but it's a challenge. What do people do? If they can't find traditional private residential insurance, they go to something called the surplus lines market, which is sold through a surplus lines broker. Think Lloyd's of London or other non-admitted not totally regulated carriers, and they write insurance. It's very flexible, but also expensive, and less regulated by my department. And so as a consequence, there aren't as many consumer protections. But that insurance is there. Then finally, the insurer of last resort in California is called the FAIR plan, F-A-I-R plan. It was established by the legislature in the 1960s. Ronald Reagan signed the bill establishing it. It's essentially a consortium of the insurers. It's a nonprofit, and it has to sell fire insurance anywhere in the state, anytime you need it. So just to put this in perspective, they're the canary in the coal mine. If I saw fair plan policy subscriptions shoot up dramatically as the insurance commissioner, that would worry me because that tells me people are not finding private traditional insurance on the private admitted market. They're not finding surplus lines markets going to the fair plan. Well, we have roughly 13.6 million dwellings in California, um, and that includes uh, multifamily structures. Um, about 8 million of them are insured. The fair plan only has about 130,000 policies. 130,000 policies, of which roughly 90,000 are in urban areas like Los Angeles, where there's a high incidence of arson, and roughly 40,000 or so are in rural areas. So only 40,000 fair plan policies in these counties like Tuolumne currently, which tells you that um, we're not at a crisis yet, but we're seeing year-to-year -year growth in the fair plan policies uh, on the order of 20 or 30 percent. Absolute number is pretty small, a couple thousand policies a year. But that percentage growth tells us something, and that is insurance is becoming increasingly unavailable in some places. Okay, so what does that mean for Santa Barbara? Fourth from the bottom. Right now, 18.2% of the homes in your county are rated by the insurers as high or very high risk. What does that mean for Ventura County? 20.6% of the homes in Ventura County rated as high or very high risk. What I think is going to happen is that in the wake of the 2017 fires, the insurers will update their models and will take into account these fires. And these fires behaved, as you've heard from fire officials, in very unpredictable ways. We're seeing more frequent, more severe, and more unpredictable fires in California. We no longer have our fire season. We have a year-round fire season now. And the insurers are beginning to account for this in their models. And so what we're going to see is more homes in more counties rated as high or very high risk. And that includes Santa Barbara and Ventura County. Now, I can't give you a precise quantitative estimate as to what number or what percentage but I would anticipate that it's not going to be 18.2% and it's not going to be 20.6%. So you're going to be, begin to experience more challenges, those of you that live in these areas, with regard to finding insurance. So, I directed the department last year to do a complete study with regard to this issue of fire insurance availability. We have a complete report. There's copies of it out on the table. We're also going to push out uh, a link to our website uh, that will uh, allow you to look at the report. But here's some of the findings in the report. First, from 2010 to 2016, we had a several-fold increase in consumer complaints to my department about fire insurance or homeowners insurance availability. Most noteworthy, non-renewals are up 15% in the wildland urban interface counties. What does that mean? So from 2015 to 2016, a homeowner that had insurance, 15% of them were told, hey, we're not going to renew your insurance. That's a significant number. Now, that doesn't mean those people couldn't find insurance, but it means the insurer they had said, that's it, we're out, we're not insuring you any longer. Then they had to find someone else or go to the surplus lines or go to the fair plan. Third, as I said a moment ago, some major insurers are starting to restrict their writing. Fourth, um, some consumers have been pushed to the fair plan. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, fifth, we're starting to see increases in premiums in these higher risk areas as well. So it's not just an availability issue. They can also charge more based on the nature of the risk. Now, I regulate their rates. They have to justify rate increases, but based on the experience that just occurred, I anticipate they're going to come in and file for higher rates because of the enormous losses. Now, they can't take all $12 billion in those, in those losses and jam them into next year's rates. We don't allow that. 
Uh, we, in fact, have a catastrophe load in the rate. They have to spread that $12 billion out over an average of losses over the last 20 years that are catastrophic losses. So all $12 billion won't show up on your bottom line for insurance next year. But there are going to be rate increases, and those losses will be built into to rates going forward. Um, so let's go to the next slide with regard to our findings. One of the things uh, that troubles us is that uh, with regard to these risk models, um, many of you might be following the directions of fire officials with regard to how to make your homes more defensible. Maybe it's more defensible roofs, more defensible eaves, clearing space around the house, all these things the fire officials tell you to do. Well, it turns out that doesn't mean you get insurance. You can do everything a fire official tells you to do to make your home defensible, and the insurer can still say under California law, eh, we're not going to write you. And in fact, the models they're using, most of those models don't actually take into account the things you're doing to make your home de more defensible. And we think that's a big problem. Second, um, there's no standards for these models. There's no standard that governs the insurer's use of the model, so they can use basically any construct that they want as long as it's rational. Uh, third, we don't get to regulate any of this, the Department of Insurance. So we don't regulate their underwriting. The legislature's passed laws that, that enable them to decide where to write insurance or not write insurance in this context. Um, fourth, we're also concerned that there really isn't good credible data with regard to fire losses. Now, some of the big insurers have good experience data because they're big and they have a lot of policies out there and they get a lot of data when they have losses, but the medium and small insurers don't have enough data, so they go to third-party vendors, buy the data. Oftentimes, the data includes losses in other states. It's not California-specific. We think this is a real problem. We think there ought to be better data on welfare loss experiences. And then the last bullet is that um, uh, there are 12 counties that have 50% uh, or more of their homes Rated as high or very high risk. Those counties are experiencing trouble. We're recommending uh, legislation be enacted that provides that if you as a homeowner do the things your local fire official tells you to do or meet some other standard that's set in law, and that can be a very high standard, then you ought to be able to get insurance. That's our recommendation. Or at a minimum, if the legislature doesn't want to do that, at least provide that if you do whatever this standard is to mitigate the potential of loss of your home due to fire, you meet that standard as high as it might be whatever it is, set legislatively, then if it's not you get a right to have insurance offered to you, then at a minimum you get to have what's called differences in coverage insurance, which is all the other insurances that you would normally have in your homeowner insurance policies. You'd get the fire insurance from the fair plan, you get all this other insurance for the private insurer. Second, uh, we're recommending the legislature pass a law that gives you a premium credit if you meet a certain mitigation standard. You do all this work, it seems to us you ought to get some credit for it, so that's our second recommendation of the legislature. Third, um, we think that these risk models that they're using ought to be followed with my department. They're not currently required to be followed by the department. We asked for them. We looked at them. We think there's problems with them. They don't take into account individual mitigation. They don't take into account community mitigation. Uh, there's other uh, components of the models we think that could be improved. So we think the legislature should require the, the insurers to file them with my department. We would review them. We could approve them. Fourth, uh, we think there ought to be an appeal process that you could have recourse to. So when you're given a risk model score by the insurer, uh, you could appeal somewhere, perhaps us, to say, wait a minute, you know, that score doesn't actually reflect what's on the ground. I know it was done based on satellite imag imagery and all these factors, but look what I'm actually doing. Um, and then uh, fifth, we think that there ought to be more data collected statewide on fire loss and give me the authority to collect that data from the insurers so we'd have better, better data. So uh, we're a consumer protection agency. Uh, no question is too small or too big for us. Uh, we're at 1-800-927-4357. Um, and that is for any line of insurance whatsoever. We do auto, life, health, home, annuities, disability, long-term care. And I'll just close by saying this. I really appreciate, as I hope you do, the 1,400 men and women that work at the Department right. of Insurance. Um, we're going to switch gears and talk about tourism right now. Again, I'm Kathy Janega Dykes. I'm president and CEO of Visit Santa Barbara. People may not know what Visit Santa Barbara is, but we're the official tourism marketing agency for the South Coast. Our job is to drive visitation to the Santa Barbara area. And this afternoon, I just want to focus on the impact that the fire and the debris flow has had on tourism and hospitality um, and walk you through our tourism recovery strategy. And just as a point of reference, normally our visitors spend about $1.7 billion annually just here in the South Coast and employs over 13,000 people. But as you can see, um, our industry is a very strong economic driver for our county. But we suffered a substantial uh, economic blow, but we really do believe that brighter days are ahead.
And these are the headlines that we faced immediately. And this is just an estimate, but the global media coverage conservatively was reaching over 2.5 billion people. And even our local residents, um, Oprah, Ellen, and others were posting scenes on social media, in some cases airing footage on their shows, scenes that were unrecognizable. And as we determined how we were going to navigate post-recovery messaging, it was really imperative that we continue to monitor and vo um, sen the sentiment and volume the recent disasters have had on all of our social conversations. On Instagram and Twitter alone, these events reach a potential of 8 billion impressions online. So after conferring with a number of our tourism economists, we've begun to look at the financial losses for our industry just in the months of December and January alone. And again, these are conservative uh, estimates. In December, the hotel revenue loss was about $6 million. Uh, additionally, there was an estimated overall loss of spending by travelers for goods and services of $23 million. This is the um, services that are typically our visitors would spend on retail and restaurants and recreation and arts and entertainment. In January, our hotel rooms did fill, um, but uh, they were filled by displaced residents and first responders at much lower rates. It's estimated that these displaced residents and first responders uh, spent an average about 25% less on other goods and services. So our challenge was how do we strike this delicate balance of demonstrating support, support for this unprecedented tragedy while communicating that area hotels, restaurants, and attractions in Santa Barbara and Goleta and throughout the county were open for business. So drawing upon the lessons um, from our colleagues in Sonoma, Puerto Rico, and even Las Vegas, we created a three-phased um, approach to tourism recovery. During phase one, um, our goal right then was providing accurate and timely information to our visitors and stakeholders. We paused all of our media. We worked with the Chamber of Commerce to uh, secure rates for our residents. We hired a crisis communication firm. We updated our travel advisory pages many times daily. We worked with uh, key stakeholders to make sure there was a unified front. Um, and we deployed weekly emails uh, to our members and provided toolkits for them. And our messaging during this time was really led by PR communication, focusing on facts but with a tone of gratitude. On phase two, which was really when uh, the highway reopened, um, search and rescue had slowed down and media exposure was dwindling, we were able to again activate. It was now time to welcome our visitors back to our community. But because of the media coverage um, of the fires combined with the debris flow, we knew that we really had this uphill battle. Um, we needed to drive immediate visitation. So it's important to note that about 70% of the social conversation around the fires and also the debris flow was within California, and Los Angeles had the largest conversation outside of Santa Barbara alone. However, this was our challenge because looking towards LA, we were trying to, again, encourage our bread and butter market to return to Santa Barbara, and we first had to change the image of Santa Barbara in the eyes to those of the South. So we integrated, uh, uh, initiated integrated approach to tourism recovery. We used our traditional PR methods um, as well as digital and print uh, programs. But we focused on new mediums and new channels. We now have digital billboards in Los Angeles welcoming uh, visitors back to Santa Barbara. We launched some radio advertising, but the media goal was reaching the drive market. Our social media, we enacted a two-fold uh, welcome back strategy. Because our local retailers and restaurants and attractions were suffering, we um, enacted a, a social media push that encouraged our Santa Barbara locals to really um, act as visitors and be able to support local businesses. And simultaneously, we launched a campaign focusing on our drive market where we showed uh, pictures of Santa Barbara's blue skies and blue oceans. And during this phase, um, many of our hotels were also um, but these real-time campaigns were then promoted across our top California markets. And the messaging that we used was Santa Barbara Shines. And we really felt that this certainly promotes 
our resilience in our community while sending a very positive and heartfelt message about what's open. And during uh, this phase, many of our hotels were facing a, a number of cancellations and frankly, they still are for group business. So it was critical that we were in front of our key clients, in front of our key media, and talking to them personally and talking to them about what's open as well. So we hosted a series of events in Los Angeles. We hosted desk sites in LA and New York and Toronto, again, so they could see firsthand that Santa Barbara, again, is open for business. We are fortunate um, to have a number of valued partners that came to our rescue with uh, recovery opportunities. For example, Visit California, which is the state tourism marketing office, is investing upwards of $2 million um, across paid, earned, and owned channels to really showcase Santa Barbara and a number of upcoming TV spots, blogs, paid, uh, and banners. And they're going to be amplifying the message that Santa Barbara is welcoming visitors. We also had our colleagues in Los Angeles. And these are our competitors. They're also trying to attract the same visitors that, that as us. And they also are working with us to amplify that same message. And finally, for those that are on the freeway, as we face Carmageddon on Highway 101 from the influx of, of recovery workers traveling to and from Santa Barbara, we're working closely with Amtrak um, and on initiatives to encourage our visitors to travel. So while the recent tragedies have really um, paused our core brand uh, efforts, we have a really strong, well-researched plan to resume in Q4. And this plan is designed to rebuild demand for long-haul visitors and incremental room nights. We're really building upon the equity of the American Riviera. So what's the travel uh, forecast? Um, being cautiously optimistic is probably the best way to respond right now. A local economist has said that it generally takes 90 days to recover from crisis of this sort of magnitude. Given that this event was not a, a one and done, in fact, um, it had reoccurring events, it may take us longer. But we all know in this room that Santa Barbara is such a very special place, and we have many reasons to hope for and expect the best. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Holland, your county clerk recorder and assessor. Um, what I want to do is <clears throat> talk about the challenge of lowering the assessments on properties impacted by the debris flow. <clears throat> the, um, we've had a number of fires in Santa Barbara County. The assessor's office has gone out and reassessed those properties. It's usually fairly easy. If you notice that a house is burned down, you remove the improvement value, and then you might remove 10 to 20 percent of the land value. Then as they rebuild, we bring those assessed values back. <clears throat> it became very clear early on after the, we were allowed to get back into the area of the de debris flow that this was going to be more of a challenge. You'll see why in a few minutes. The, um, there were 401 properties damaged by the debris flow. <clears throat> That's up from 370 that was originally reported to us. And that number may go up as we are out in the field. The total assessment on those was $1.2 billion. There was, that's 1,335,000 square feet of uh, improvements <clears throat> on 995 acres. Uh, interestingly, uh, four of those houses were over 10,000 square feet. 31 of them were between 6,000 to 10,000 square feet. Within that $1.2 billion number, the Biltmore's in there at $215 million. So, not sure how bad the Biltmore has been impacted, but it's still closed. It's not expected to open until June 1st, and they're thinking that's really optimistic. They had some underground storage, uh, food storage units that were damaged, and they're, not, they're just not sure they're going to be able to make it by June 1st. And I'm not sure how much damage that is. We have to look at the economic damage of being closed for six months and also the <clears throat> physical damage to that property. Also within that $1.2 billion is the San Ysidro Ranch. The San Ysidro Ranch, uh, assessed at $43 million, is very significantly damaged. And um, we just don't know. When are they going to be allowed to open up again? Um, and so... It's a real challenge to 
figure out how to uh, lower their assessment. So what I'm going to do now is just show you why it's such a challenge. Uh, w what we did is we co commissioned a flyover uh, to take aerial photographs at 4 inch resolution with an oblique angle so you can see down at a 45 degree angle on the structures from all around the structure. <clears throat> and um, you can see this, some of this photography on my website, the before and after at sbcvote.com. Okay, so, so there you can see on slide one, this is down around Jamison Lane. There's the 2015 versus the 2018, uh, January 21st through the 24th. So there you can see there's some mud around that house. That's uh, looking north. Okay, now here's another angle looking south. You can see that's pretty impacted by the mud. There might be two to three feet of mud there. And then what's kind of interesting also is you see the citrus groves next to it. Those had two to three feet of mud in there. Don't know if that's going to kill all those trees or not. I've heard that this mud is pretty good for growing. And... Um, We'll have to see. So there's an example. I don't know what we're going to do with that house. So here, again, you can see the before and after. You can notice the pool um, in the top left hand to 2015, and it's gone. It's filled with mud. Um, and you can see on an angle down in there that the house could be fairly severely impacted. And again, we're going out to some of these properties, and it's looking like Oh, you're not going to be able to rebuild that? And, and they're, the homeowners are telling us, no, we're not going to be able to rebuild it. Now, here's Olive Mill Road and Hot Springs. When I drove out there, as soon as we were allowed to go out there, this is when I noticed, oh, my gosh, we need to have, because if you look at the damage and you look to the right where those houses are, if you're standing out there, you don't know where the property boundaries are. So we actually had our staff go out there with a uh, Wi-Fi and laptops with this um, aerial photography so they could stand next to the property and kind of figure out what's going on. Okay, so, so this is an in interesting one. Um, look at that. It looks like that house, you can see it's, it's kind of in the middle of a creek now. Um, will they be able to rebuild that? It's severely damaged. So this is what's nice about this photography is that we can zoom in. Look at that. So it looks like there was some kind of a wall, a retaining wall there that helped deflect a lot of the debris. Now, if they have to rebuild that and redo that retaining wall, that's a damage that we wouldn't assess them for that because that would be the cost of bringing their property back up to a usable. This is Casa Dorinda. You can see the parking lot on the right and structures. They're all gone. And you can see the, you know, where the flood, the, the creek just came right over. And then if you look at the house down at the left, it looks like it escaped much damage. But then if you zoom in, you can see that the pool is filled with mud. And we really don't know if that house is damaged or not. We have to go out and inspect each one of these properties to individually change the assessment. That's Casa Dorinda. You, you can see the looking into the church there, and you can see how just the adjacent property, the say adjacent, Casa, oh, it's Casa de Maria. Okay, sorry. Um, you can see all the structures are gone. And what, what's interesting, if you look at the right by the parking lot, you can see some little boulders in the 2015 picture. Well, now you know how they got there. Here's a, a, another property again you can see on the left the houses are just gone and will you ever be able to you can see the I think that San Ysidro Creek crossing 192 there you can't even see the creek on the right and on on the left are they ever going to be able to rebuild those we just don't know now there's a close-up of the previous slide there's a little bit of the house left on the parcel on the highest parcel there but not much now here, on the left, we ha this is another challenge. We actually have two properties there. You can see that they're burned down. But they're also impacted by the flood. So w obviously we can remove the improvement, but we need to decide how much to lower the land value on that 
um, on those two properties there. And then if you look more to the left, you can kind of see some of the properties weren't damaged at all, but yeah, there might be mud creeping in on some of those. Now this one is really dramatic. Um, that's San Ysidro Creek there. If you ever hiked up San Ysidro Creek, um, I've done it many times, I've hiked right by that house that is no longer there. Many times. This is about 4,000 square feet. Beautiful home. Look at that. Completely wiped off the foundation. And it looks like the foundation is a lot closer to that creek, and that creek looks pretty darn dangerous today. And then this is the last slide. That is San Ysidro Creek. Those, that's like the last house built going up San Ysidro Creek. But you can just see the creek is vastly widened and still pose, poses a significant damage. So we're, uh, I've got a crew out in the field every day of about a dozen people or more. And um, we'll probably have these homes reassessed in mid-May, but it's going to take um, an individual assessment of each property. That's all I have. Thank you. My name is Betsy Schaefer. I'm the Assistant Auditor Controller for the County of Santa Barbara. My approach for this presentation was really to revisit some of the headlines and sort of put some context and perspective around the numbers. So Joe just showed some very devastating pictures. How does that translate to actual property tax losses? Um, he said that property uh, this headline back in March said 1.3 billion. He said it's now at 1.2 billion, a little bit better. Um, the estimates that I'm going to show you now, though, um, are still at the 1.3 billion dollar loss. Um, so countywide estimated property tax loss, um, current year 1718, we're looking at 6.9 million. Um, this would be represented through supplemental refund. Um, and then for a full year, um, for next year, we're anticipating $13.4 million loss, and that would through, be through the annual um, property tax um, bills. Um, and again, this is a countywide estimate. So, um, if, for example, if we were to look at just the general fund piece of this loss, we're looking at about um, as a million dollars um, for 17-18 and about $3 million for eight for a full year for 1819. And the reason that it is um, less for 1718, it was prorated. The incidents happened in the middle of the year, fiscal year, um, uh, December, January. So that's why the loss is about half. Um, the other thing um, that we're noting is TOT, which is interesting, is that there was an increase. These headlines specifically are for the city of Santa Barbara. Um, and I believe um, someone mentioned that Goleta actually saw an increase also in their TOT. Um, but what's interesting about unincorporated County of Santa Barbara is our TOT went up because we actually had a property tax increase. Uh, I'm sorry, we had a TOT rate increase. It went from 10% to 12% um, in um, January of 17. So we kind of decided, well, we need to normalize that number and figure out did we actually have an increase or did we actually have some sort of decrease, um, you know, netting out the impact of the 2% increase? And it turns out that TOT is actually down once we, um, um, you know, adjust for that 2% increase. And just, this is just to show you year over year, February over February, for the past five years, you can see the positive trend. Um, but, however, looking forward, we do anticipate um, TOT flatlining or going down. Sales tax. There is no headlines related to sales tax because we don't know. <laughs> um, there's a timing delay related to sales tax. How this is collected is the uh, Board of Equalization, um, I'm sorry, vendors um, submit their um, sales tax directly to the Board of Equalization and then they allocate it every month and then they do a true up every quarter. And so that quarterly true up for January through March will happen um, late April. Um, and to give a little bit of perspective about how much um, sales tax we get, it's about $11.6 million, which represents about 3.5% um, of tax revenue for the general fund um, at the county. And then related um, TOT is about the same amount that we just showed you, that I just showed you. 
switching gears a little bit, um, I just talked about uh, property tax, which is going down, TOT, which is going up, sales tax that is unknown, and then now um, those were all potential inflows, lost inflows, and now we're looking at um, outflows that the county um, experienced, that the county experienced. So you can see um, um, back in February, um, the county estimated $46 million loss, um, and this is county government costs, so the cost of um, repairing um, roads and debris cleanup. Um, we kind of updated those numbers um, as of March. It went to the board, and we're at $55.4 million. Um, we separated this out between general fund and special revenue fund. The general fund loss of 13.9, that really represents the extra hours that the sheriff had to put through and the time spent at the OEM, um, the Office of Emergency Management. Um, the special revenue fund loss is really the public works um, cost for roads and flood control. And we did have some um, public health and ADMA test costs in those also. But you can see the vast majority is really related to um, the special revenue fund. Um, what's interesting here is we put this in reimbursable and non-reimbursable. Reimbursable, reimbursable um, really means that hopefully FEMA is going to give us money, right? Reimburse uh, our costs for this. There is a cost-sharing formula, and when, um, when it happens, it's usually about 90-plus percent uh, FEMA will, um, will reimburse, reimburse us for, and then we pay um, the difference of about the 6%. Um, that is good news. We'll get reimbursed for so much money, but the, the real issue is the timing of the cash flow because it may take us a while to complete all the reports that are required in order to get um, FEMA money, and then the timing of their actual reimbursement to us could take a while. So, and then uh, we just talked about the per personal property loss. I really don't have an update. I think um, um, uh, Dave Jones talked about that for Santa Barbara County. Um, and then I, I just put a note in there about maybe some FEMA loans and grants. Um, you know, I've heard, though, that those amounts are really minimal. They're usually a few thousand dollars, so not a lot of money there. So trying to put a little bit of uh, perspective on total, um, I'm showing um, property tax at uh, loss at $33.7 million. Um, that includes current year plus um, being optimistic um, two years to get us back to a full um, assessed valuation of property and um, at $26 million, um, really a question mark on TOT, really a question mark on sales tax. County damage we just talked about, $55 million, personal property, 204 and then if we just add up all the red numbers there, we're looking at $293 million. Um, and then... Um, if we subtract out the personal property loss, we're looking at $89 million and then $46 million of county unreimbursed costs. So, um, and you know, I, I need to emphasize, this is just pieces of the cost puzzle because we don't really have all of the um, numbers for um, the special districts like Montecito Fire or Carp Summerlin Fire, so what their costs are. Hi, I'm Megan Orloff. Um, seven days a week, I am a Montecito resident. I built this word cloud, and really this word cloud, if, if you're familiar with them, is really intended to capture things that you hear in conversations over the course of time. Uh, there's no science behind this particular word cloud. Uh, it was really developed off of, as I was thinking about the conversations I've had, the stories I've overheard, what are the things that are really resonating with the Montecito community, both residents and businesses? Some observations. There is really a complexity of emotion um, when you talk to people and residences and businesses in this community. On one hand, you have a tremendous feeling of loss and anxiety and frustration and helplessness. And on the other hand, you have hope and determination and, as I said, resiliency and this feeling of unity. Um, and the spectrum is really varies depending on the day and, not surprisingly, the weather. Uh, it, it really has the propensity to change people's opinions on any given day. Montecito isn't a place that you just end up. It's a place that residents have chosen for any number of reasons, whether that is the semi-rural charm, the character, the quiet community, the quiet streets, the local businesses. We all have ideas about how to rebuild and reinvent ourselves while maintaining the very attraction that brought us all here in the first place. And we can make this more special, but we need to do it together, and we need to do it with each of you. Good afternoon. 
Uh, today I'm going to take a different approach. You've heard a lot of figures and I want to pan out and look at some of the larger issues we're facing. Uh, a lot of issues that small businesses have been dealing with uh, started even before the Thomas fire and I think what we've seen is some of the recent incidents are really magnifying uh, some of those issues. So I have a lot of slides, oh, there we go. Um, and first, let's start with the fiscal impact to the city. Looking at TOT and our bed tax, we have a few months uh, of information. We saw a 25% decline in December from the fire that resulted in a lot of smoke and ash. Then in January, we saw an increase of 22% with more rooms taken by evacuees and first responders. For sales tax revenue, we don't have our final sales tax numbers yet, but we're anticipating a loss of up to $1 million for the December quarter out of projected annual revenue of $22 million. The city is eligible to recover, uh, or I should say first, buying local whenever possible. Looking at our costs, um, the city is eligible to recover most of its eligible costs from FEMA and the state, so this, the emergency response cleanup costs, uh, Betsy covered a number of them. Revenue losses can't be recovered, and we'll be considering the use of reserves to cover any shortfall. Our reserves have been fully funded for a few years, so we have them for this purpose exactly. From here, I want to take a step back and look at the larger picture of economic vibrancy. To get prepared for an economic forecast present, I wanted to find some good indicators to show what's happening out there. New businesses opening, businesses closing, businesses for sale. I was surprised to learn that we don't have good numbers that tell us what's going on. And then I realized that economic vibrancy is not easily measured. You know it when you see it and when you feel it. As we start to look at what reco recovery means, I want to point out a few bright spots for economic vitality. First, infrastructure funding. We took a huge leap last November by passing Measure C. Thanks to community support, we'll have a local revenue source that can't be taken away, and there's a real return on investment by paving our streets and paying for more expensive repair work that needs to happen. This is the funding that's going to help us keep up our shine and paying for the more, uh, uh, more critical buildings, remaining a world-class city, very critical to economic vitality. Arts and cultural activities are also a significant component of our economic vitality. The city provides over 700,000 each year for events, festivals, and the arts. The film festival, summer solstice, puppet palooza that just started this year. From ticket sales, dinners, souvenirs, overnight stays, the impact is tremendous. The Americans for the Arts recently released a study on the economic impact that this industry generates. Almost 200 million in annual economic activity in the county, supporting almost 6,000 jobs. And then finally, while very tragic, our recent hardships really brought people together. Now we need to channel that same strength, energy, and nimbleness to improve the business climate as well. Recent incidents have really just magnified the issues we were already having. So to really address economic recovery and get on the right track, we need to ask some hard questions. And I'm going to lay out four of those for us to consider. How do we change our community culture to help local businesses and entrepreneurs be their best not just survive. In most presentations, I like to talk about how wonderful we are with many accomplishments, and I'm sure I'm not alone. My, my organization is probably similar to yours. We work very hard. We're proud of our teams. We live here. We want the best for Santa Barbara. But we also have to be careful because too many pats on the back could go to our heads, and it may not bring out the best in us. It may even contribute to mediocrity. We need more honest assessments of what's really working and what's not, and not being afraid to make mistakes and learn from them. We need real conversations where we have safe spaces to listen, share suggestions to move forward, and a culture of problem solving where there's diversity of thought and openness to new ideas, not just the ideas that we like. Our problems are multifaceted, so how do we build an ecosystem for innovation and new ideas? All of our organizations and businesses are interconnected. There are many players. There's no single driver of economic vitality. It belongs to all of us. The city, county, MTD, numerous business organizations, small business owners, property owners, commercial brokers, incubators, co-working spaces, developers, lenders, we're all in this together. It's not about one ship adjusting its course. 
It's about the entire fleet. How do we embrace tradition and nurture new ideas? Basically, how can we say yes more often and try new things? Santa Barbara's charm is not just architecture and natural beauty. It's the energy of the people who live here and what we create. I talked about our infrastructure earlier, taking care of the foundation of streets and our public buildings and making sure that Santa Barbara doesn't lose its shine. Now that we're handling that, the next challenge is making sure Santa Barbara keeps its pulse because red tile roofs are enough. Santa Barbara is such a beautiful city, but the downside is it's easy to become complacent while the world is changing around us. And the world of retail is evolving quickly. So we need to be open to fresh new ideas and concepts. This is a good time for us to experiment and test new models. Temporary pop-up shops, creative use of vacant space, closing a part of the street to vehicles for a day. And since we're very isolated, we need to make an extra effort to learn from what's happening from other cities. Those experiences can help us to figure out what does vibrancy look like and how we encourage it. Vibrancy may look different for everyone, but we can all agree on what it doesn't look like. Vacancies. Filling vacancies is a top priority for the city. By our last count and just focusing on downtown, we have 27 vacancies. And we're defining this number as spaces that appear unoccupied to someone walking down the street. They're dark. There's no tenant. We've introduced a new Accelerate program for State Street where your project goes to the front of the line for design review or building permit. Council just added vacant spaces on Post Village Road to the program also. Our goal is to get spaces occupied faster. We're six months in and we're seeing some improvements, especially getting more approvals done over the counter. But we know we still have work to do. The city also started a new fee-based service to give early input on tenant improvements, which can help new business owners understand a space before they sign a lease. The city council and staff are taking this very seriously and they welcome your ideas. Beyond vacancies, we need to spend time thinking about how we maintain a vibrant downtown core and keep people engaged for 14 blocks. Over the last 10 years, it's become more complicated because new hubs of commercial activity have emerged. The Funk Zone has clearly taken off with art galleries and tasting rooms and the newly ho opened Hotel Californian. The area known as the Lagoon District with the mill, sandbox along Haley Street. There's an area known as the Hub along Parker Way. The Presidio area has branded itself with several new wineries and shops around El Paseo. All of these areas are adding to more established commercial areas like Milpas Street and Coast Village Road and I haven't even covered areas outside the city. So we have pockets of activity instead of a concentration of businesses. Our challenge now is sustaining all these unique areas and maintaining a thriving downtown core. Having more housing downtown might add more vibrancy. Residents spending money on their day-to-day -day needs might rebalance the retail mix towards residents. Last year, the Architects Association hosted a design charrette to identify new possibilities block by block. Key among their recommendations was adding new housing for all income levels, above and behind retail spaces, and even downtown parking lots. The Saks Fifth Avenue building was recently purchased by Michael Rosenfeld, who most recently developed the Hotel Californian, and preliminary discussions are underway for a mixed-use housing project. And the remaining lease term on the former Macy's building was recently acquired by Pacific Retail Partners, who operate Paseo Nuevo. They're welcoming new retail and mixed-use concepts for this key site. So these are large-scale investments that could breathe fresh life into downtown. We're also really excited that sculptures will be returning next week to State Street and add more visual appeal and points for reflection. This is good news because we need more focal points, more areas to bounce and swim from, more spaces to connect, which is why we've been looking so closely at the State Street underpass and how to re-energize this space that connects the funk zone with the rest of downtown. Today, it's not a very welcoming area. We recently held a workshop for the community and a few hundred people came out to share their ideas and run free with creativity. Many great ideas were raised and they're all posted on our website from creative lighting to the use of sound and music. And if you're wondering what we can possibly do with a large mass of concrete that's holding up the freeway, I'd encourage you to check out a Pinterest page we created. And you can see how cities from all over the world added more life and activity to unused spaces. We're not the only ones who took on a design challenge. 
This is a prominent area of State Street, the gateway to downtown, right next to the Amtrak station. Whatever we do here should be done to a high standard and should be engaging for our residents. While tourism is very important, our economic vitality depends first and foremost on our residents. Whatever we love, our visitors will follow. I'll close there. Thank you for your valuable time.